My name is Ruth Cowan. I'm a member of the Irvington Historical Society Board, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Maeve Kane, uh, who is Associate Professor of History and Director of the Graduate Program at the University at Albany, but which many of us know best as the State University at Albany. Maeve has a PhD in history, but her talk today puts her squarely in the new multidisciplinary effort, which has come to be called Indigenous Studies. Indigenous Studies combines the historian's insights into the interpretation of documents with, as you are about to find out, um, the anthropologist's and archeologist's insights into interpretation of social structure and culture. And even as we all will soon learn, Epi epidemiological insights into the demographics of disease. We're all looking forward, May, to learning from you. Thank you so much, Ru uh, Ruth. Can everybody in the back hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. If, uh, if I get a little quieter towards uh, the middle or anything, please wave at me if you have trouble hearing me. Um, thank you all so much for joining me today in beautiful Lenape Hoking, or, or the lands of the Lenape. I am not Lenape. I am not indigenous. I am a white lady from, New, uh, from Minnesota who lives in New York now. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the survival of Muncie Lenape people and nations into the present, uh, and especially their sovereignty in the present, and I'll end there. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank the Irvington Historical Society for having me, Ruth Cowan in particular for inviting me and organizing this, uh, and all of you for being here on what's a really beautiful day. I don't know why you're here in the dark with me, but thank you anyway. Um, so this is where we are. Uh, this is a map of Lenape languages uh, and culture area in this area that we now think of as kind of New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Lenny Lenape is an older form of the name. Lenny Lenape is kind of a redundant term. Um, the current modern preferred term is Lenape. Uh, historically, the Lenape were also sometimes referred to as the Delaware as well. There's three main language groupings within the Lenape. Um, these are mutually intelligible but distinct languages. The Muncie Lenape towards the north uh, in where we are up the Hudson Valley. Uh, then the Northern Unami and the Southern Unami. Those are slightly distinct uh, language and cultural groups that spanned all of this territory. The people who became the Lenape uh, occupied this territory basically from the peopling of the North American continent. The glaciers began to recede out of this area of what's now New York and New Jersey about 13,000 years ago, uh, and people began occupying this territory very soon after. Um, on some of the maps that I'm going to show you, both these kind of modern maps and some of the more historical maps I'll show you in a bit, um, you'll see both Mohican and Mahican at different points. Mohican and Mahican are interchangeable. Um, English and Dutch ears could often not make a distinction between those two. But there is a distinction between Mohican and Mahican, who are a Lenape group, and the Mohegan, who are a Massachusetts group uh, further north and further east. So a little distinction there. Uh, the Lenape are considered by other Algonquian groups as the grandfather to all Algonquians. Algonquian is a large language and cultural group in what's now the U.S. Northeast. Uh, Algonquian is distinct from the other large language and cultural group, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, uh, further north and west near where I live in uh, Ganeen-Gahaga, Haudenosaunee or Mohawk Iroquois territory beginning at Albany and spanning all of what's now Western New York uh, and Southern Canada. The Lenape uh, forms of governance, and I'm gonna get into more detail with this. Um, Lenape forms of governance differed very greatly from European forms of governance. And that, uh, that formed a really significant part of kind of the structure of contact and how people understood one another. Because this was not a single national group. Uh, before contact, the Lenape understood themselves as many different nations working within a similar uh, cultural context. Um, before contact with Europeans, there were 30 different clan divisions 
within those three distinct language groups, uh, sub-language groups that I just showed you, and as many as 80 settlements up and down the Hudson Valley, Long Island Sound, uh, and Delaware Bay, spanning all of that region. And there was a distinction, both for the Lenape and other indigenous groups, between the idea of governance and government. And that has caused a lot of um, conflict in the past, confusion in the present. Uh, indigenous groups, the Lenape included, absolutely had governance of their communities, but they did not have a government in the way uh, that is very particular to the 17th and 18th century European context that then forms things like the United States and Canada. A government is uh, a top-down hierarchical structure in which uh, people have a kind of a centralized decision-making structure. Many indigenous groups uh, had what's called decentralized or consensus-based governance. So all of these independent communities acted independently from one another, although they shared kinship ties, they shared cultural ties, they shared language. Uh, these communities up and down the Hudson River Valley here, uh, and we're uh, kind of in uh, Wappinger territory here on this map and a little bit further south. These communities operated independently from one another. Uh, after contact with Europeans, this caused quite a deal of confusion because Europeans often tried to seek out who they perceived to be as in charge, someone to make a decision or a deal or a land sale, especially uh, on behalf of this larger group. The Lenape in this area were about 20,000 people on the island of Manhattan itself at the time of contact in 1609, and as many as 20,000 additional people throughout that whole territory of Long Island Sound down to the Delaware Bay. Um, so when Europeans sought out a central decision maker, they were trying to find someone to be a, act on behalf of all those 40,000 people. And as anybody has ever been in a committee meeting knows, that's hard even in a small group. So I'll come back to contact with Europeans in just a little bit. The experience of this area uh, was an important part of the story of contact. For folks that haven't encountered this website already, um, I really love this website as kind of a deep dive into the ecology of this area. Uh, Wileykia.org is the work of Eric Sanderson, who's an ecologist, ecological scientist. Um, it doesn't go quite this far north here to Irvington and Terrytown. The furthest north is in Wood Hill Park here. But it's a block by block reconstruction of the ecology of the Manhattan area in 1609. Um, this is a snapshot of the web page for this furthest north breach. Um, but it gives you like a really detailed view of where are the settlements on Manhattan Island? What is the ecology or landscape resources like in this area? And this area is incredibly unique in the richness of its ecology. Sanderson's argument uh, in this website and his book, Manhattan, a Natural History of New York City, um, is this, this area is one of the ecologically richest areas of North America, um, rivaling like the ecological diversity of Yellowstone uh, right now. And the way that uh, Lenape peer, people kind of moved through this space was um, both kind of uh, in, in dialogue with the space and managing this space. Um, this is a modern painting by a pa painter named Len Cantillo uh, of a Lenape village in this area of kind of Manhattan Island in the Southern Hudson Valley. Uh, and this is, I don't want to overemphasize like peaceful pre-contact uh, Native Americans. I'm going to come back to pre-contact warfare in just a little bit. Um, but archaeological reconstructions of settlements in this area suggest that people um, moved seasonally across the land, but did have kind of cultivated areas. And when Europeans entered this area, they perceived that. Uh, some of the earliest European writing on this area talks about how park-like and Edenic it was. And that was a very deliberate product of landscape management. Selective burning, seasonal movement throughout the territories. Um, there's archaeological evidence that a lot of these settlements were in river bottom areas with very rich soil, uh, agricultural areas that were managed by women on behalf of their larger extended families very nearby to the villages, and unfortified. That'll become important later in the 17th century. 
There's also a lot of evidence of how diverse people's diets were. There's archaeological, like you can still in some uh, areas near these settlements, there's archaeological remains of like heaps of clamshells as tall as I am, just enormous. Um, archaeological evidence of the huge range of fruit, vegetables, animals that were being hunted, um, a really rich diet in relation to the land. Um, and one of the reasons I love this painting is that little white dog that you see in the center. Um, dogs are an important part of Native American culture, just like many other human cultures. Um, the pre-contact breed of dog that was most prevalent in North America is no longer around, um, but that little white dog is a kind of reconstruction of early depictions or descriptions of this. And when Europeans entered this area, uh, in addition to remarking on the park-like and Edenic nature of the landscape, um, they remarked on the, like, the enormous fertility of the landscape. And that was, in fact, one of the main things that attracted Europeans to this area. Uh, when Hudson first sailed up the river that now bears his name in September of 1609, uh, Robert Jewett, one of the mates on the ship who kept kind of the journal of Hudson's journey, remarked that a small village like this one could dry enough food and was in August and September of 1609, drying enough food to supply three ships. Like how bountiful this landscape looked for them. Uh, Jewett himself was kind of thinking about this area in terms of profit as soon as, uh, as, soon as Hudson's ship entered the area. This is one of the first maps made of this area. Um, this was made in 1635. Um, and Jewett's descriptions, written descriptions of Hudson's first journey and this map itself speak to how Europeans viewed this area. Um, I use this a lot in classroom visits with K-12 students because uh, there's a couple of things that kind of jump out in like, what are Europeans thinking, but also some tensions in that thinking. Um, K-12 students often love the very strange depictions of animals. This guy down over here. No idea what that animal is. Um, but in some of the other ones, like beavers, deer, etc., you can see Europeans thinking through, like, what is the wealth of this area? But from a very early date, interested in the, what would become the fur trade, um, which was at that time primarily controlled by uh, what the uh, states that would become Russia. And the Netherlands were thinking about how to get around that and cut in on that trade. But there's also a really significant tension in this map and later maps that will come uh, after it, which is this need to know who are the people on the ground, but an interest in claiming that territory, even though there's not a possibility of controlling that territory yet in the 17th, early 17th century. So this is a zoomed in area uh, or part of this map. This is Manhattan Island is this very small Yellow Island here, and then this is the Hudson Valley. Here in Irvington, Terrytown, we're kind of up here. And then where I drove from today, this is Fort Orange, or what will become Albany. Um, I'm going to flip back. This is Lake Champlain, and I highlight that. Yeah, if you've been up to Lake Champlain, that is not where that is. <laughs> um, I highlight that because like, there's pretty good detail of the coastal areas. Uh, but there's not a lot of detail, and especially like the connection between Lake Champlain and the St. Lawrence Valley. There's no European knowledge of that because they haven't actually gotten there. There is a lot of detail on the names of different indigenous groups, especially up to Hudson to Fort Orange and along the coast. Uh, and then there's overlaid on top of all of this, New Netherland. <laughs> This is the first map to use that term New Netherland to claim it for, uh, for the Netherlands. So it makes that claim in part to stake a claim against other Europeans. These pink blue uh, areas on the rest of the map um, are, are acknowledgements of other European claims, but even within that larger like pasting New Netherland on there in big letters, there's this contention with the fact that like indigenous people are still the ones that occupy this territory in 1635, and that will remain really significant. <laughs> so this interest, this 
hunger to know about indigenous people comes in part from the necessity of trade, that the fur trade from a very early point is like the main economic driver of this area. It will remain so after the American Revolution. Uh, but this doesn't always extend to like actual real knowledge. This is the first uh, image that was purported to be of Lenape people in this area, uh, and it's not. Uh, I show this image because this is a reprint of many, like it's hard to pin down where this image uh, was first printed, but this is in the 17th century, this is reprinted with the label Lenape, Africa, Guiana, Java. <laughs> it's like, it just kind of becomes a generic kind of portrayal of otherness in a lot of combinations because you've got like this palm tree here, a pine tree right next to it, um, where like, the Dutch are so hungry for this knowledge of others that they're beginning to encounter in the 17th century, but there's not a lot of like actual knowledge coming back. Uh, and that will have really significant effects on how people interact then uh, actually on the ground. This is one of the actual first images of a Lenape person. Uh, this is labeled Virginia because when it was reprinted in Europe, people are not sure where stuff is. <laughs> um, but people, as people try to grapple with who is there, how do we understand this place and these people, um, there's not really a concept of race as we understand it now. And by race, I mean uh, what's, what's more precisely uh, called your phenotype. Your phenotype is like the color of your skin, the texture and color of your hair, the shape of your nose and your eyes, things like that. Race is the combination of those things culturally with ideas about people's personality, people's uh, uh, intelligence, people's uh, persuasion to like criminality to get into kind of 19th century pseudoscientific racial ideas. That has not developed yet in the 17th century. Uh, early in the encounter, people don't have that kind of hierarchy of race. It will become constructed over the period that we're talking about. So they're grappling with like, how do they define themselves and others? And one of the primary ways that they do that is by focusing on uh, cultural specificities of clothing, tattoos, how people present themselves. Um, so you can see in a lot of these early images, a real focus on that. And you, you might not be able to see this super great in this image, but the tattoos are across this man's eyes. Um, Europeans were often not aware always of what they were looking at. Um, but Lenape oral historians and knowledge keepers who have looked at this image have argued that, um, so for Lenape culturally, tattoos often signify things about their personality or things about what they have done uh, in their adult lives. And this man's water lines across his eyes suggest his strength or his connection to spiritual power. <laughs> this is another early image uh, of a Lenape family in this area. Uh, and Lenape people very early on uh, adopted cloth, European trade cloth. This is like the foundation of the European Lenape and larger European indigenous relationship in this area. Uh, but they didn't completely replace everything that they were wearing. And you can see that uh, in this image where we've got kind of cloth wrapped skirts for both the man and the woman here, but still very distinctly indigenous modes of dress. This is not a case where Europeans came in with cloth and it immediately replaced all uh, indigenous forms of dress. But like you wouldn't mistake these people for 17th century Dutch people. And that remains part of the tension. Um, people wore things like this probably wampum or otherwise beaded belts uh, along with their European trade cloth. Things like turkey mantles um, that were supposed to be very beautiful and iridescent in a day like this. Also very warm and water shedding. Uh, and Lenape people, for their part, also looked at the strangeness of Europeans. Um, these are really unique pieces. Um, some of these are Mohawk, some of these are Lenape, um, but these are deer antler combs that have been carved to look like Dutch people. Um, and these aren't, these aren't the kind of combs that you like stick in your hair and wear as decorative. You use these to comb your hair. Um, some of these, uh, so there's a lot of these. You, they show up on archaeological sites all over the place. Um, sometimes these have just geometric decorations, sometimes these have clan animals, sometimes they have um, figures from Mohawk or Lenape, uh, like stories, uh, folk tales, creation stories. And they seem to be kind of like people's cell phone cases where like 
sometimes it's a significant thing to that person. Sometimes it's just neat. So it's not always like the Dutch were mythical, magical beings or anything. Um, but these are really unique because there's not a lot of indigenous portrayals of Europeans until later in the 19th century. There's very few of these. And you can see in this, uh, and especially the one in the lower left, where there's a relatively plain woman uh, reaching out to the, the man with the hat and the gun probably there. People don't mark the person that's kind of the self. The self is unmarked, unremarkable, because you know what you look like. When you're making an image of another, you mark their strangeness, what's new, what's different, and what's interesting. And you can see Lenape and Mohawk people kind of grappling with that here, um, where like we know that these are Dutch because they got hats, they got pants, and they got buttons. Uh, and like that shows up in some of the earliest dictionaries, some of the earliest translations, where Lenape people called the Dutch hat people, button people, and hatchet people. Like those are the terms for the Dutch. So you can see people kind of defining each other, like what is significant about them. <clears throat> so by 1676, uh, this map is made in 1676. We've got more detail here. Um, this is a slightly later map. You can see Lake Champlain still kind of floating in question mark. Not sure where that is. Um, we're down here. This is Manhattan is down here. And then this is the Hudson up here uh, and Albany right there. A little more zoomed in there, so we're Long Island and the Hudson River with Wappingers and kind of Terrytown and Irvington over here. So this interest in knowing and categorizing others didn't always extend to recognizing land ownership or jurisdiction. In fact, it was often the opposite. This um, European and especially Dutch hunger to like know indigenous people, categorize them, uh, often was in service of dispossession, really specifically land dispossession. Um, the Dutch have this reputation for not being as, um, as brutal in their relationships with uh, Native people as the English do. That's changing a little bit now, I think, with more detailed awareness of this area. Um, but there's often this stereotype that the Dutch were here primarily for trade, that they therefore did not make war, that they were not interested in converting native people like the French were, so they were relatively uninterested. Uh, and all of those things are untrue, especially in this area of the lower Hudson Valley. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Because beginning really soon after contact with the Dutch, there's a series of conflicts that escalate to really significant proportions. Because the Dutch, yes, were here for trade, but they were looking to trade in the interior where they perceived beaver hunting to be. They were also looking to settle and have land in this area as a base for further trade. So who occupied what territory became really significant. That's why we see so much detail of which uh, native groups are inhabiting. And I would actually say there's a lot more detail about native groups in this later map because they're so interested. Um, so, New Amsterdam uh, uh, established fairly early on, 1614, Fort Orange, what becomes Albany, 1614, 1624, uh, and there's a very significant trade in beaver with, uh, with the Haudenosaunee, especially the Mahican, Muncie, uh, further north at what's now Albany. And beginning very early on, there's this series of wars over who is going to control the territory and trade. Um, the Mohican uh, near what's now Albany and the Mohawk had a long-standing conflict over access uh, to what's kind of the Schenectady forks of the Mohawk and the Hudson that predated co uh, contact with Europeans. Um, there's oral histories from both the Lenape and the Mohawk Haudenosaunee about this war, that this extended for at least two generations before contact with Europeans. After contact, that boiled over in what's called the Mohawk-Mohican War in 1626. Uh, and the Dutch largely attempted to stay out of that, but because they were concerned with access to, to the trade, with uh, they perceived the Mohawk to be more powerful, they ended up siding against their previous allies, the Mohican, with the Mohawk in that war. And that'll uh, remain part of the story of the 17th century. Over the course of the 17th century, and I'm going to get into more detail uh, in a bit after I move away from this slide, uh, 
the Lenape in this area really struggle with demographics um, because there's just wave after wave of epidemic disease while they're facing this increased pressure from growing Dutch population in this area. So at the same time that we have declining Lenape population, we have growing Dutch population pushing further and further into these territories up the Hudson Valley, up Long Island Sound, up the Delaware Bay. <coughs> and this creates increasing tensions over land, really specifically because of that changing population. Um, there's also a concept that indigenous people had no concept of land ownership or ownership in general, depending on uh, what you read. And that's not true. Um, people absolutely did have a concept of land ownership, like especially of personal property, like you don't steal somebody's nice Dutch person uh, antlers home. And they did have a concept of land ownership, but it differed really radically from European contexts. Um, European concepts of land ownership themselves are also changing really radically in this period. Um, earlier in the medieval period, what was called usufruct or right to use of land had been much more common. Um, this was the concept of like a large landowner or noble family might own a large piece of land, but uh, people have usufruct right to go gather windfall or firewood or other things on that land. So usufruct right to enter uh, and use certain resources on that land. And that's much closer to what seems to have been the concept of land ownership for native groups. That's why Europeans were able to kind of map out these territories, because these different uh, Muncie towns, Lenape towns, had a concept of like whose territory is where, whose town and settlement is where. Uh, so in early interactions with Europeans over land, these concepts of land were like the heart of a lot of these early conflicts. Uh, in some cases, Europeans stepped into pre-existing conflicts like the Mohawk-Mohican War. In the other cases, these concepts of land uh, triggered what became much larger conflicts. Um, the sale of Manhattan Island is pretty famous, uh, apocryphally being sold for $24 of beads and cloth and things. Uh, what seems to have been more the case, if you kind of read between the lines of what little written description we have, uh, other con like context from uh, oral history, and etc. What seems to have been the case is Lenape people understood themselves to be selling the usufruct right to some portion or some resource on that land. Because you could no more in Lenape concepts of land ownership sell a piece of land than I could sell any of you the air in this room. Like you might by sitting down at a restaurant and paying for a meal be like buying the air in that room for a little bit. But like it's a bizarre concept to even think about. Like you, you just can't sell air. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be at the heart of these conflicts of like just there is no concept of selling the piece of land. Whereas Europeans believe themselves to be buying exclusive fee simple the way that you would buy a house now. So this is a long way of saying uh, that beginning with 1643, Keith's War, a decade later, 1655, the Peachtree War, there's a series of wars that, um, that were triggered by these conflicts over land. Um, Keith's War in 1643 was triggered over uh, the murder of a man named Clay Switz uh, on Lenape territory, what was very clearly Lenape territory. And the Lenape refused to hand over the person accused of the murder to the Dutch government because it happened in their territory and the Dutch, uh, the Dutch were uh, angry about this and triggered a two-year-long war trying to identify and bring uh, the accused murderer in for execution. The Peachtree War, um, so that's one conflict over land and whose jurisdiction applies. The Peachtree War uh, in 1655 was triggered over the murder of a young woman who had gone picking peaches from a piece of land that uh, a Dutch farmer believed he owned, and the Muncie Lenape mm -hmm. believed that they had sold usufruct rights to grow on, uh, and boiled over into, it was ultimately only a one-day occupation of New Amsterdam, but uh, uh, about 50 people died during this war. These are relatively, in the scale of 17th century wars, these are relatively small conflicts. New England throughout this period has much larger wars going on, like the Pequot War, King Philip's War during this period. Uh, so in comparison, New York and the Hudson Valley often looks much more peaceful, much smaller scale. 
But these conflicts boiled over uh, really significantly right before the English takeover in 1664. In 1659 to 1663, um, there's a series of Esopus Wars. There's not a clear delineation between uh, each of these wars. But they began with these small conflicts over who has jurisdiction to land, who has right to what land, and they just escalated in severity. Uh, the attacks between uh, Esopus and Wappingers, who eventually allied, uh, and Dutch eventually culminating in nighttime attacks against uh, villages of sleeping women and children, and ultimately the sale of several hundred Esopus women and children into the Dutch Caribbean as slaves. Um, so there's no longer an Esopus population that knows itself in the Caribbean, but there are, like, there's been DNA research done in that area that suggests that there's a, a, a traceable portion of the population uh, of Dutch Curacao has Esopus ancestry from the Esopus War. So you can see in this um, a couple of things. First, that indigenous politics from before contact mattered with the Mohican Mohawk War of 1626. Uh, but also that these conflicts over what land had been sold, what jurisdiction is there, um, really mattered to how people interacted. People were interested in knowing each other, but often um, used that knowledge of one another to push jurisdiction further and further out, uh, out from Dutch territories. And this was accelerated really rapidly and really significantly by the impact of disease. Um, this is on um, the uh, left axis over here, this is how deadly a disease is, with further up things like Ebola and rabies, uh, untreated rabies being the most deadly, and lower down, less deadly. <laughs> Still don't get E. coli. Uh, and then on the lower axis here, how, uh, how infectious is it? So over here, not very infectious, not very easy to pass. And over here on the right, much more infectious. Unvaccinated transmission of COVID is right here for reference. Um, stuff like whooping cough and measles that are making a comeback because of low vaccination rates are over here. <laughs> um, and so I've been teaching college students for about 15 years now. And what I've seen in my classrooms is students understand what a little bit what this was like a lot differently now post COVID than they did pre COVID. And I would actually say that's the case for myself as well. Um, because what you, uh, what native people, Lenape, Haudenosaunee, many other groups experienced in this period was post apocalyptic in scale in a way that I think is really hard to imagine, even uh, having gone now through COVID and all of that upheaval. What we saw with COVID unvaccinated was this just over 10% uh, uh, mortality rate for infection. And we saw just absolute social upheaval. The fear, the kind of, uh, the fear created specifically from not knowing what was going on in those early days. Uh, and that was just one disease at a time. What indigenous groups in this period uh, from the late 16th through the 17th century, so a uh, span of about a century, experience was not just one wave of COVID, but wave after new disease after new disease. And it's not the case that native groups are less uh, genetically adapted to these European diseases. It was that they had no previous exposure. European groups had uh, lower, lower mortality rates during these things because typically the adult population is the ones that lives through this. You would have a large population that lived through, for example, smallpox or whooping cough or diphtheria as children. And so, yes, you may have high infant mortality during an outbreak of measles or whooping cough, but you wouldn't lose your adult population. But what indigenous groups experienced was a lot of these things hit different age groups at different times and with more significant effects. So something like smallpox uh, actually most significantly affects people that are kind of what we would now call working age, like 18 to 40, the most healthy adults in the community, because smallpox uh, triggers like what's called a kytosine uh, storm. I'm a doctor of history, not a medical doctor. <laughs> um, so smallpox like attacks, uh, uses an immune system response against the body. Same thing with influenza. Whereas something like whooping cough or measles more significantly affects uh, infants and small children. 
something like tuberculosis uh, or typhoid or cholera more significantly affects uh, older adults, people that we now call maybe retirement age. So even if communities only get like one of these things a year, smallpox one year, influenza the next year, whooping cough the next year, measles cough, uh, the next, mumps, uh, typhoid, etc. If you're dealing with that year after year after year, you're cutting out parts of a generation each time a new wave of disease goes through. Uh, so what the Lenape experienced during this period was throughout that large area, kind of the uh, Long Island Sound down to Delaware Bay uh, and Manhattan Island, 40,000 people were reduced to about 3,000 by 1,700. That's a more than 90% loss of population. If you just think about looking around the room, what that would look like. <laughs> and that's in the context of those, that series of wars that are escalating in their brutality uh, and level of attacks in addition to people who are being sold into slavery in the Caribbean. So this is how Europeans in this period are able to push for a series of increasingly coercive, increasingly corrupt land sales. Um, the most notable of these is the 1737 Walking Treaty. Um, Pennsylvania was primarily dealing with the Lenape who had been pushed out of uh, as a result of these wars in the Hudson Valley and Man Manhattan Island, as well as disease, Lenape people were kind of pushed north and south and west in this period into places like Pennsylvania. Um, this image is really famous as like an icon of Pennsylvania's peaceful treaty relationships with uh, the Lenape and other indigenous groups, but it's actually a retrospective kind of propaganda campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, this commemorates the, uh, William Penn's 1682 treaty with the, with the Lenape, um, and it was made in 1771 by William Penn's grandsons, or commissioned by his grandsons, uh, by the famous painter Benjamin West, uh, because the 1737 walking purchase was being contested, and almost successfully contested. The walking purchase uh, was originally agreed upon to be the distance that a man could walk up the Delaware River in a day, and instead, it was a group of hired runners that basically ran a relay race to just mark out much, much larger area. So this famous icon of Pennsylvania's peaceful dealings with the Lenape is part of this story making already at the time of the legitimacy of these treaties, while at the same time, the Lenape are being pushed further and further west out of their own territories. The Lenape are um, those 80 towns. 30 clans, 40,000 people reduced down to about 3,000 now scattered up into New York. Uh, some had taken refuge with the Oneida in what's now New York. Some had been pushed out as far as, uh, as far west as what's now Pittsburgh. Some even further west into uh, what's now Ohio and Indiana. <laughs> this did not mean that there was not still a small group in uh, this lower Hudson Valley, uh, New York area itself. This is one of the last depictions of a Lenape person in this area of the Hudson Valley. This is a Stockbridge Muncie soldier who served during the American Revolution. There was a small remaining population in this area. Um, most of the adult men in this area served in the Continental Army during the American Revolution <laughs> and were really significant in uh, like some of the most pivotal battles of the American Revolution, the capture of Fort Ticonderoga, uh, the battle at Saratoga that brought the French into the war, and the Battle of Monmouth. Um, they were ultimately disbanded after the Stockbridge Massacre of 1778, where they lost a very significant battle to uh, a British troop of Queen's Rangers, and the majority of the adult men died. Uh, one Stockbridge mother who wrote for a pension claim after the war wrote that she had lost all seven of her sons uh, at the Stockbridge Massacre. The Stockbridge are also, like the Stockbridge experience of the American Revolution, um, or excuse me, the Lenape experience of the American Revolution is also significant because they are the first indigenous nation that the United States made a treaty with. Uh, and that was the Treaty of Fort Pitt, 1778. This is at the site of what's now Pittsburgh. The Treaty of Fort Pitt is this really interesting moment of possibility that was opened up. Uh, because what happened was the Lenape were the most significant group in the Pittsburgh area, the largest population group in that area. 
having been pushed west as a result of these 17th century wars. And the Americans made this treaty to ensure their safe travel through Lenape territory in what's now Pennsylvania to attack the British at Detroit. And one of the key pieces of negotiation of that treaty was that there would be the creation of a Native American state in basically what's now Ohio with full statehood rights and voting in Congress, if you can kind of even conceive of such a thing. Uh, and it collapsed really immediately. Um, it was signed and negotiated at Fort Pitt. Everybody involved there was happy with it. It collapsed in the Continental Congress because this negotiation over the existence of a Native American state could not be accommodated in the vision of what, what was going to become the American nation. Uh, and several years later, towards the end of the war in 1782, these possibilities collapsed um, with the attack at Gnada Hooten. Uh, Gnada Hooten in Western uh, Pennsylvania was a Moravian settlement, Moravian Christian settlement of Lenape um, that was attacked by American militia because they believed that they were British allied uh, Indians. They made no distinction between British allied and, and American allied. Uh, and this, Amer this continental militia slaughtered people in a church as they sang hymns in Lenape. Um, and the Moravian church still regards them as martyrs of the, of the Moravian church. So it's this, the American Revolution is kind of this collapse of the last possibilities uh, of, of a Lenape existence in their ancestral territories. I'm going to kind of zoom through uh, the 19th century a bit so I can end in the 20th century. So the story east of the Mississippi is about the Lenape being pushed further and further west at every turn, and that continues through the 19th century. Um, this is a painting done in the 1930s of uh, what uh, by a Lenape painter, Jacob Park, of, uh, of what the Lenape call the last removal. These many Settlements, many uh, sub-communities of the Lenape throughout this area were removed many, many times over the course of the 18th century. Some portions of, of the community were moved first to Oneida, and then when the Oneida were moved out of New York with them to Wisconsin, so Muncie Lenape uh, Nation is currently in Wisconsin. Some portions of the Lenape were removed first to Pennsylvania, why they're in Pittsburgh, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri, Kansas, Texas, Mexico. The final removal of the population that now resides in Oklahoma um, was from this promised territory in, uh, in Kansas as the United States began to expand into it, and finally into Oklahoma. So there's a series of uh, promises that had been made by the United States government over the course of the 19th century uh, that culminated in what Jacob Park here called the last removal because of this repetition of uh, population pressure moving into Lenape territory that began in the 17th century and continued as the United States expanded west. <coughs> the Lenape remain a sovereign nation. Uh, there are three Lenape reservation territories in, within uh, the United States, two in Oklahoma, one in Wisconsin, because of this dispersal during 19th century removal. There's also three reservation territories in Canada as well. Uh, and sometimes when I speak on this topic, people, people like I've been asked straight up, which one's the real one? Uh, they're all the real one. Um, there's no single central one because of this long history of colonialism, land dispossession um, that created these pressures for people to preserve what they could. Um, sometimes that was around uh, specific Christian churches like the Moravian church. Sometimes that was around specific communities like the community in Kansas that were moved to, um, to Oklahoma and so forth. So there is the, what had been these many settlements, many nations of the Lenape in this area of what's now New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania is now six separate uh, independent governments that are all nations themselves. Uh, and over the course of this removal, so this is Minnie Poots, uh, taken, or photograph was taken in about 1930. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of photos that have been colorized by the current Lenape uh, of Oklahoma tribal historian Jim Remender, because I think it's interesting to kind of see the humanity in people. Remender puts these online, um, colorized to kind of emphasize kind of the modern connection to these historic people. 
Um, Minnie Foots in the 1930s was really significant for the Lenape of Oklahoma because she, this is the era of uh, uh, boarding school pressures, removing children from their homes, uh, pressure to only speak English, uh, pressure to abandon traditional agriculture and uh, craft work. And Minnie Foots was really significant in um, preserving a lot of traditional trades, language, etc. The United States government used this, this pressure of colonialism, the federal boarding school system that destroyed many indigenous nations, uh, language, uh, language speaking, not only for the Lenape, but many, um, as an argument in the 1950s through the 1970s that indigenous nations no longer existed. So one of the things that Lenape Nation, uh, both Stockbridge Muncie and the two Oklahoma reservations faced was the threat of what was literally called termination. Uh, termination was federal Indian policy for much of the 20th century um, that the United States would no longer recognize their existence as nations. Stockbridge Muncie Nation in Wisconsin never lost their recognition, but they were threatened with it for uh, several times during the 1960s. Uh, uh, Delaware Nation of Oklahoma did lose its recognition and only regained it in 2009. Uh, and the uh, women like Nora Thompson Dean here uh, were really part, really significant part of um, retaining cultural sovereignty in the face of loss of political sovereignty. Um, so Nora Thompson Dean here is one of the primary people who preserved a lot of Lenape language and craft work. Uh, and she's actually a really significant part of like how academic historians now know as much as we do about the Lenape past. Uh, because during this moment of political loss of sovereignty in the 1960s and 1970s, she did a lot of oral history work to reconstruct like what did pre-contact life look like? So she's actually pictured here wearing a reconstruction of a bear skin and turkey feather mantle like the ones that Hudson would have seen people wearing in 1609. So academic historians now rely on her reconstructions because she did so much uh, so much work with oral history work with uh, Lenape speakers at that time to reconstruct that, to save what knowledge there was despite these two centuries of pressure. Um, if you're interested in any of this further, these are some of my recommended sources, uh, books that I like for this. The first five of these um, are all by Lenape authors. The last four are by non-Indigenous authors. Uh, but Nora, Dean Tom or Nora Thompson Dean uh, wrote a cookbook of some of the recipes that she reconstructed from this oral history work that I think is really interesting if you're interested in that further. And I can flip back to that. My editor told me to do this. Um, my book is for sale. If you, <laughs> it's over, for sale over here. Um, my primary work is Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Women's History. Um, although I touch on this area uh, in my work as well. Um, if you aren't able to get a book tonight, you still want one. If you order through the Cornell University Press website, I have a 30% discount code for you. So thank you so much all for coming tonight.